sometimes you know an hour long lecture is is a uh, really difficult to get through when you have a teacher lecturing to you the entire hour. Just getting the students to talk in the middle of class about the pertinent subjects that we're discussing in the lecture is going to be helpful in breaking up the lecture. I think that the professors expected the students to just sort of soak it up, you know, in, in a typical lecture, uh, you know, content delivery mode, and the students were just supposed to absorb it and be able to spit it back out again. We know that Group work is a great way to help learning. Uh, when the students are working together, they're very actively engaged, processing the material as they talk about it. And we know that's exactly what's essential for achieving good long-term learning. Group work isn't a magic bullet. It has to be done right. Uh, and there are a number of challenges to make it work well, dealing with things like organizing the groups and the kind of tasks you give them to do. This video will show you some different examples of group work and tips for facilitating it based on research. First, we'll get a snapshot of the benefits of group work, then take a brief tour of what group work can look like. Then we'll give some key tips on facilitating group work, like choosing the members of the group and helping them work together productively. Finally, we'll talk about what kinds of tasks are best suited for group work and how to assess student learning. When I'm not learning something or when I'm not getting something, by working in the groups, I'm able to experience it through a different way um, and, and see how other people are thinking about it so that I can better understand the concept rather than just the, the single way that Dr. Knight explained it. There's an enormous body of research showing how feedback, very timely specific feedback, is the single most important contribution to learning effectively. One instructor with 30 or 50 or 200 students, you don't get that, but you can get a lot of useful feedback from your peers. So we can look at the wavelength and say, these have the same wavelength, so they must have the same wavelength. And you really get a chance to work over problems regarding these experiments with you know, people that are close to or on your level and not a professor who's you know, done these for 20 years before and is way above you. It really helps reinforce the ideas in my mind to explain them to other students at my table. There's lots of research showing that teaching other people helps one learn the material. People process the ideas in a very different way. Their brain thinks about them, structures them differently when they're, when they're confronted with the idea of teaching another human being about them. That's really why the teaching process that can occur in group work enhances learning. There are a lot of different kinds of, of group work. There's out-of-class study groups, in-class discussions, or in-class group activities, or you can have longer-term collaborative assignments. Most common is just to use these shorter-term in-class group work. For example, tutorials, concept mapping exercises, worksheets, labs, uh, and more. Here are three examples of these kinds of in-class techniques. We have one activity that we do, which is to try to understand um, the correlation between energy and temperature. And so uh, it's the kind of thing that you can lecture students on and they somehow don't seem to ever get. And so the way that we, we did it is we, I gave students a worksheet and they had to sit in groups and answer the questions on the worksheet. So there's always a worksheet. I, I asked them to break into groups of somewhere between four and six. I have myself and a TA in the class and we kind of circle around the different groups and listen in to hear sort of what the conversations are. We have some evidence for these things helping students learn, both from things I've seen in class because I eavesdrop on conversations. And I'm hearing students having conversations we want them to have. But I mean, what other factors of our sine waves are related to energy? We've used whiteboards to have students draw a sketch. Um, or a graph. We've had students use whiteboards to do a short derivation, one that maybe required just a little moment of insight, and it only takes a couple of minutes, and, and it, sometimes it sweeps through the room. So the idea was we are talking about a very complicated physical system. The hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics has many, many variables and quantum numbers, and the pictures in the textbook are horrendously complicated. The task was generate a picture 
that would represent the hydrogen atom wave function in the following simple case. We tried using notebooks instead of whiteboards, just to have people write answers on a piece of paper, and I was amazed at how few students would write anything down at all, and I think I decided they don't want to risk writing something wrong in their notes. So, you know, what we want is for them to have the freedom to write some nonsense down, um, to get ideas wrong and then fix them, and the whiteboard is perfectly well suited for that. Whiteboards also give me the chance to walk around the room and see people generating ideas. So that was the purpose of that whiteboard activity, was just for them to generate this representation on their own. And even if they didn't get my representation, they're ready to see it now. In, in the group working class, I, I like to try to have the students focus on either designing an experiment or interpreting the results of an experiment. So today in class we were talking about um, neuronal plasticity. So the experiment was that you close one eye um, early in the life of a kitten. We were given the lecture kind of on the very basic concepts of this experiment, which is a seminal piece. It's huge in our field. And then they were to make a prediction about what happened if you close both of the kitten's eyes early in this phase of development. And that was the, the part of the, of the experiment that was, had a surprising outcome. What we had to do is you have to be able to understand the basic concept and then we had to apply it to this new uh, parameter and I think that what it, what it did was it made every student walk away with a really complete understanding of the experiment. And to the right of that picture that you're just showing me, it's a straight cortex. The biggest challenge is the time the groups spend working together. The, the literature says you'd like to have that be at least 40 hours. That's not practical for normal classrooms. Uh, but the essential element is that you need to have the people work together often. If you have um, had a, a lecture-based class for six weeks, and then all of a sudden you try to get them to work in groups, they're just not going to know what to do. It's a part of class. It's not a special thing that happens, it's not a different thing that happens, it's an expectation. And what we found is, is when, when one doesn't happen, the students miss it. They wonder where it went. The groups have to be big enough to tackle the problem at hand. For a really extensive long-term project, uh, it needs to be more, uh, up to maybe as no more than seven, but close to that. Uh, for the shorter term in-class kind of activities, working on worksheets, et cetera. Uh, three is probably best, maximum is probably four. There are many factors that go into forming a group. The literature has lots of recommendations on this, but it really depends on your own situation, and you should not sacrifice the good to try and be perfect. It's generally good to have as broad a range of perspectives and skills within the group as you can, but if you're working on a much shorter term, smaller project, that becomes less important. One point that has continually emerged is it's good not to have a single minority of any type within a group. They can become isolated. Ideally, the teacher should create the groups because this is seen more fair to the students. Um, and as a teacher, you ideally want to have a range of abilities within uh, the group, but if the tasks are reasonably short term, it works pretty well just to choose randomly. The biggest challenge is always conflict within the group, and you can help with that a lot by talking explicitly about how groups can work effectively and have the group members discuss that by themselves. One thing that's important is for the instructor to wander around the classroom and listen in on how the groups are working. This helps you give much more effective feedback on both the group dynamics and also helping the students learn the material. It's an interesting phenomenon because we haven't been conditioned to do group work in our career and that's a little tough. There's a little bit of pushback because some people just want to be lectured to and that's enough. Students need to be motivated to work together. They need to see it as rewarding and they need to have some level of accountability for both what they do as a group and for their work as individuals. And it's demotivating if you grade them on a curve because then that's putting them in competition with the group members. There are other challenges like developing a sense of, of trust and willingness to disagree and how to comfortably resolve conflict. Uh, but these are all things that come with practice as a group works together. I've been with my table um, throughout the whole year. 
So we're, we've grown to know each other and really get to interact with each other every class period. So we're really close for one. And we also understand each other's strengths. And I think that's really nice to, to get everybody's opinions and know who's better at a certain topic than other people. Many more members of the group become comfortable talking to each other after about 25 hours, some research shows. The kinds of group activities one gives them also can help a lot in promoting the effective group work. So in constructing the group activities, I think that one of the most important things to do is to make sure, first of all, that you've selected something that actually is really important for that class period. So you want it to be one of, you want the activity to be about something that you really want the students to remember. And it has to be something they can sink their teeth into. It can't be too easy. One thing that makes this work the way it's worked for us right now this semester, and a key aspect of these activities, are the types of questions. If you have an activity that's just as simple as, you know, write down a few terms on a piece of paper to define some things. I mean, what benefit are you going to get from that? When you're actually in class with you know, other colleagues and the professors and TAs and everyone else there to help you out, you can really start to address some of the more difficult issues rather than just the simplistic ones. And I think that's what really makes group work exceptionally helpful. I found the first year I taught it, some of them sort of worked and some of them were kind of duds and I had to rethink, you know, the ones that didn't seem to work. You know, if I had an activity that was maybe too quantitative, you know, I would just see students plugging numbers into their calculators as opposed to sort of thinking about how to set up problems. I would then in the second year go back and redesign them. Similarly, students have to find the task interesting and relevant. First off, it was an interesting topic, so that just really helps with everybody getting involved. For me, you know, I want to think about new ways of approaching problems and you know, thinking about experiments, not necessarily just rehashing material. When you're assessing group work, first you can't grade on a curve. And you also then want to have some level of assessing the output of the group, for example, grading the something that they turn in as a, as a group or having them report out to the rest of the class on their activities. Uh, or one of the eyes and all the pathways from that die But second, that. you really want to have individual accountability as well. So either the students have to turn in some work individually or you have some exam questions that directly reflect on the activities of the group. And this this individual accountability really helps deal with the problem of, of one person just loafing and letting the others do all the work. I need to be completely present in class and so just by being a passive learner I don't retain as much. And just having that personal interaction with my peers and being able to revert back to those conversations that we had just really helped my understanding so that when I saw it on the test, it just came back to me. A lot of us don't learn the exact same way, so for me to explain it in multiple different aspects, in multiple different ways, it really helps solidify the concept in my mind, as well as, you know, enable my peers to learn. The best students, they might be spending a lot of their time teaching to the students who are struggling, but everybody wins from that because the best students learn from teaching it and the students who are struggling are getting a much more individualized instruction at the level they can understand than what the instructor can provide. The first thing I think I would say is just to go ahead and try it because it can't hurt. It's very fun to see the students kind of relying on each other and themselves to get the information as opposed to always thinking that I'm the the source of all knowledge, which I definitely don't want to want to be. <laughs> I want them to be creating it for themselves. So I think it really comes down to, I'm going to sacrifice, you know, 10-15 minutes of, out of my week of lecture where I could be telling them about one more experiment versus I'm going to give them one group work, one, two pieces of, you know, sheets of paper and they're really going to know what I'm talking about. I mean, I think it it's completely changed my classroom. What's really beneficial about these group activities and peer discussion opportunities in class is to get a chance to approach those kind of problems in a similar manner that a scientific professional would get to do in the field. So in a way it really really prepares students for careers in their you know discipline of choice be it biology or physics or whatnot. I think it's I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm.